Hello and good afternoon everyone. What an awesome start we've got off to and this is one of my favorite things to watch. Birds of prey soaring effortlessly and highly efficiently just about directly above us and we've decided to keep an eye on these vultures. That's exactly what they are. Just in case they could possibly lead us to a kill and they're a great indicator and species for taking us to kills made by other animals or an animal that may have just died of natural causes and during the drought that we're in herbivores are certainly battling away you can see that it's a cloudy afternoon and there's a small chance of rain this afternoon but i think the initial part of the safari should be okay now these vultures i think are just enjoying floating above us and interestingly they were heading quite far to the east and then turned around and almost circled directly above us and i wonder what they thought of their view looking down on myself scott as well as tebs who i'm teamed up with on camera today this is a live safari if you're joining for the first time it's a great privilege to have you with us and it's important that you know that you can communicate with us and let us know questions your thoughts observations by using the hashtag safari live on twitter or sending an email through to questions at wildearth.tv it's a bit of a breeze, so that coupled with the cloudy weather means we are in for a pleasant afternoon. We're not going to be too hot. It's 28 degrees Celsius and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And it is 4 o'clock in the afternoon here in South Africa. We are in the northeastern corner of our country. And we are in a reserve called the Sabi Sands. And it's a wonderful, wonderful game viewing destination that is attached to the Kruger National Park. So, very, very privileged to be driving around here. And the fact that we've got a lot of first timers joining us, as well as some seasoned veterans, means we have got a great broad spectrum of safari goers. Well, my plan is to initially head out in search of tracks of a female leopard who tracks we actually ha had crossing out of our property this morning out of our northern boundary and we're going to just go and have a look and make sure she doesn't come back to visit. If someone found it jumping around we might be able to get it crossing the road here. Oh there it goes. And in this windy weather, a lot of the antelope and prey species are going to be skittish, so we can expect nervous behavior from, from them. Tibbs, I think there's another one about to cross the road. We should be able to get it quite well. If you just wait on the road, you should get it. There she comes. The graceful impala. And Tibbs is miraculously staying focused on her through basically an impenetrable wall of vegetation. And the good news is, is that the lady you are about to meet is not going to be very nervous. Her name is Janie, and I think we caught her just at a bad time. I think she's just hopped off the vehicle, possibly to look at some tracks, who knows? So you'll go over to her in a few minutes, but it's the two of us that are out, and that's important for you to know, and you'll be chopping and changing between the two of us, depending on who finds what and when will be jumping about, like I say, from vehicle to vehicle. Oh, and 
Angela, thank you very much for sending through your question regarding the Inkahuma Pride of Five Lioness. And yes, we do have an update on them, Angela. They have sadly moved further west, away from our, our western boundary into Sibambili. But we've got good news, and it's not only us thinking about ourselves. We often put the animals first, and the Inkahuma Pride are our regular pride of Ryan that we do see, and they were successful in making another buffalo kill last night. So we're happy for them, but obviously a little bit disappointed they didn't do it on our property. But they did catch a, a young buffalo, similar, it sounds like, to the size of the one that they caught the day before. Um, probably six, seven month old buffalo, roughly. Not tiny, but a decent size. And by the end of the sunrise safari, when I got a hold of the guys in the west, they said that the lioness are about halfway through. So we're going to have to wait until tomorrow morning to follow up on them. And I've got a funny feeling that they're going to come back. So I think it's worth tuning into the Sunrise Safari. Well, it's basically worth tuning into every safari because you simply do not know what is going to happen. So if you don't want to miss out, then keep tuning in. to Eric and you've got a special request that we say hello to Kim Adams as you'd like to get her involved in a school please let us know what school where in the world it is it's always wonderful to know exactly who we're dealing with and isn't it remarkable that we're in Africa completely different time zones many thousands of miles away from a lot of you yet we're all sharing this wonderful experience together in real time so Eric we forward to hearing more from you about this school and Kim maybe you can actually let us know a little bit more about what's going on and like I said hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv just spotted another bird of prey up ahead here and it looks like an African hawk eagle it's one of my favorite raptors. I just want to sneak a little bit further forward before we let Tebs try and get a view of it. Always tricky with the birds. They fly so quickly that we sometimes get showed up by them and the plans often don't go according to how we would want them to. And it looks like this one might be no different. It's flying quite low heading away from us and I just don't think we're going to get a view of it over the canopy of the trees but let's just wait a few more seconds it may catch a hot air thermal and rise up very quickly a little bit gap there oh if you go straight through that gap there you got a glimpse of it and it may do one more circle into the gap again hopefully mm, yep there we go so not the best view, but it's a bird of prey, and I'm fairly certain that it is an African hawk eagle. But the good news is, is if we take a look straight down this road, quite a long distance, I just spotted some more animals. Ta-da! So we're in luck, a herd of elephants, and off we go. We're gonna have to hurry because they are heading straight to our northern boundary, which they will cross quite shortly. I just want to sneak ahead of them and try and get you a couple of good views before they disappear. And for the new viewers, it's important that you understand that it's just the humans that have got boundaries in this area, and for good reason, so that any one area doesn't get too congested. But the animals have got free reign, and they've got basically 4 million hectares to explore. That's bigger than quite a few countries on the planet, so it's a wonderful natural ecosystem that we're a part of. It sounds like you guys had a wonderful sighting on the Juma waterhole camera of a water monitor lizard catching two African bullfrogs. Fascinating, and that's so cool that you got to see that. And Tony even managed to get a screenshot. 
And Tony, thanks for sending that through to us. Awesome stuff. I'm just going to slow down a bit because we don't want to disturb these ellies. And it looks like there's two young bulls trying to work out who's boss here. And they may decide to also show us their size and strength. But often it's just playful and you don't have anything too serious to worry about. Come on. Come on then. Come and show us how big and strong you are. Surely you can come a bit closer than that. You're still very far away. I'm not even remotely scared. Come on. Of course, I'm only joking with it. I'm not expecting it to respond to what I'm saying. So don't be fooled by my silly narrations there. And this one's quite nice and distinctive. He's got that little piercing in his right ear. I wonder how and when he obtained that little tear. And just like humans, animals will very often act the same way as adolescents. He is an adolescent. Oh, apologies, that is a female. Whoops. So that is not a young bull. You can see the mammary glands under her front legs. And it just goes to show, even though I've spent many hours on safaris, I still make mistakes. Oh, Tibbs, let's look on the left quickly. It looks like there's a little young calf. Oh, yes. That's tiny. Look at it, it's got a little kink in its tail. I wonder how it got that so early on. So, looks like it's got a little broken tail. And how awesome is that? Mother and calf trundling off, and that's a very young calf. So, once we've given this herd a bit of time to get used to us and make sure that they're not in a bad mood, we'll try and edge close. And I think even now we can. What would be ideal if we, is if we can squeeze through them. Oh no. It would it'd be much better if you were a young bull because the young boys are far more predictable than slightly older ladies. Not that she is very old. She is a young looking cow. But with the young around and with hormones that could be flowing through her body for any given reason, I trust the females less than the males as a general rule. Come on, we just want to go and look at the baby. If you had one, we would pick you, but you don't. Sorry. There we go. Look at the tail now. That's really good behavioral sign to, to take note of. And when elephants hold their tails out horizontally like that, you know that they are not happy. That's one of the major signs to look for. And very important reading into the animal's body language, just to make sure we don't get on the wrong side of them. And that's why as soon as she displayed her disinterest in us getting any closer, I stopped the vehicle. And that way, by respecting their communications to us, they will hopefully respect us in turn and not come charging into us. What I'm going to try and actually do is give her a wide berth. So we will off-road four animals in the big five, elephants, buffalo, rhino, lion and leopard, as well as cheetah and wild dog. What I may also do, and what some of you may be wondering about, is this funny little cluster of cameras on the hood of the vehicle and it's a 360 degree camera for, for virtual reality and you basically decide where you look and sadly we haven't got quite to the point yet where we can do it live but I may turn it on with this herd of elephants because we could get some great views of them. Let's just stop here because it looks like they are a little bit worked up and maybe it is because of this tiny little calf. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this opportunity to skirt through them. Just wait a little bit up the road in front of them. Turn around, face back this way, and that way we will be able to get a position where they can decide to move up onto us rather than us forcing our way onto them. And we may find that we are more relaxed when we do this. So a little bit of a skirt through here. Turn around and wait for them.
them to approach us, and we tend to find that that results in far better and closer sightings and encounters than if you barge into them. <laughs> Joseph, thank you for your concern and your kind words, and I do not intend on ending myself this afternoon. Being squashed by an elephant would be a terrible way to go on this fine, sunny, and slightly cloudy afternoon. So don't worry. Um, I'm feeling very confident. And it's just important, like I say, just to make sure you listen to them and, and watch them. And, and, and that way, they are unlikely to cause any major attacks on us. They're far less violent than humans or wild animals. Monique in London and you'd like to know what exactly it means when they curl up their trunk and it depends um, on, on the circumstances usually if they curl up their trunk and they're running towards you that means you're in big trouble trunk curled up head down ears flat means they are committed to a charge whereas a trunk flaying ears out head held up high they're trying to make themselves look big and strong and that's, again, a warning that they're trying to give you before curling up their trunk and committing to a charge. So it all depends, but I think, like you said, a sign of uncertainty also sounds plausible. It's fascinating. If temperature zooms out a tiny bit temporarily, you'll see that that whole tree that this elephant's feeding on has been completely stunted. It's got a massive trunk, but from about head height of the elephant, it's been continually pruned over the years. And as you can see, the pruning continues. That looks like a false marula that it's deciding to feed on now. There is also a leadwood trunk or stump in and amongst that. It's the leadwood on the left with the textured bark and the false marula on the right, and that's what she's feeding on. He's got great ivory, this female. And one of my favorite things about elephants is just watching them feed because they are doing it basically permanently. And I'm always intrigued by the variety of plants that they feed on at the different times of year. And it's just interesting to see what the kind of flavor of the month is at any point in time. And she's a, a fine specimen, quite a big, big cow. Just like humans, all animals will change and vary in size depending on the area or the individual. And if we take a quick look between her back legs, I'm not too sure if she's coming into season, but obviously you can see a bit of moisture there and a bit of coloration. So that's good to know. And obviously the ladies, when they are hormonal, can be a little bit more volatile than normal. So I've just taken heed of that. And that loose flap of skin, Mike Fleetwood, is the vagina. And on, under the front legs, you'll notice the mammary glands. So quite interesting that a four-legged mammal has got the mammaries in front, just like we do, I guess. Because most of the animals, if you think about it, have them on their stomach or even further back behind their back legs. Interesting, or elephants rather, are extremely interesting animals regarding their anatomy. I mean, there's nothing quite like them on the planet. And I guess that's just one of their unique features. What are you going to do now, missus? Are you going to come and say hello to us, friendly? Or are you going to give us some attitude? Please don't give us any attitude. Hello, how are you? And it's quite important to remember if and when elephants or any animals do give you any aggression, by me talking permanently now in a calm voice, it's kind of giving off that vibe, you could say. And then if things escalated from their behalf, we could also escalate our tone of voice and our volume of speaking, and that's gonna make the elephant think twice. 
And no different to us as humans. If we are sizing up an opponent or thinking about confronting somebody, usually you talk before you jump in, fists flying, and it's the same with wild animals. There's a little bit of vocalizations often before anything serious happens. And we too can vocalize. As we reposition the herds, kind of just moving parallel to this open little strip. I can chat with Mike in Montana. Montana sounds like a wonderful part of the US, and maybe one day we'll be able to come and visit you there, Mike. Mike, you are spot on with your guesstimate of the weight of this tiny young elephant calf. And you've put it somewhere in around the 200 pound mark, around 90 kilograms. And I couldn't agree more with you. I think that is a very good guesstimate. And elephants are generally born in and around that uh, weight category, around the 100 kilogram weight category. Hard to believe, but I guess an animal that can grow up to six tons and has a 22-month gestation period will be born quite large. Good. Well, we're going to race you across to Jamie, who's found some water buck, and by the time the elephants surface, I'm sure you'll be back with us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a rather windy sunset safari. And in fact, this wind is unsettling everything. I'm sure Scott has mentioned it while he's been out. And I've just been sitting watching this female waterbuck, and Viam and myself were chatting about the way that she's ruminating. A little bit earlier, the sun was out, and you could see really clearly, watch as she swallows this ball of cud down and up again. So you can actually see the bulge in her neck as she swallows and the bulge as the cud comes back up again. There you go. Awesome. I always find that fascinating, the level of control that they must have over their stomachs to be able to direct the ball of cud that they've chewed down into their stomach and then bring up the next ball that's due to be chewed. I wonder if they ever make a mistake and they chew the same ball twice or the same cud twice. Fascinating to watch. Of course, there you go, down again. And up, up again. Fairly regular intervals as well. She's very consistent, this lovely female. Now on this glorious sunset safari with promises of more rain to help relieve our drought this evening. Welcome, my name is Jamie. I have Viam on camera with me this afternoon and we're coming to you live from an area that is, and I stand corrected on this because I've been giving you the wrong area. It is 3.9 million hectares of unfenced wilderness area. And I've actually been, in this particular instance, corrected on that or have heard the size of the unfenced Greater Kruger National Area about three times this afternoon. And on a very much related thought, Joseph, Cindy, and many others, you were all wondering how Brent is. Brent is back. He is on the mend, and he will be back out on drive tomorrow morning. All things happening as foreseen, and back to his usual self. So you'll be happy to know, as I am relieved myself, that he is on the mend. But he does thank you for all of your very kind wishes and kind concerns. It was almost certainly tick bite fever, but we might never know. In Palace? You're playing hard to get. You're also lying down ruminating. The wind playing havoc with them as well. Dallas, you were 
wondering, I'm trying to get you a nice image of these particular antelope. You were wondering if I could tell you about the difference between antelope and gazelle. And essentially a gazelle is one of the families of the antelope in general. So it's in much the same way that there's a difference between frogs and, and toads. Toads are part of the frog or one of the frog families and gazelle are part of the antelope family. So there's no real difference, it's just a matter of subdivisions. And antelope species are divided into what are known as antelope tribes, each according to their own individual characteristics, for example, with the spiral horned antelope. So the Nyala, the bushbuck, the kudu, all united by that spiral horn, as well as other general coloration and habitual similarities. And I would love to tell you more. Uh, generally, impala fall into their own particular, their own particular tribe, which is actually quite closely related to gazelles. So gazelles, part of the uh, the antelope family. And while we carry on and look for more wonderful antelope and other things to show you, Scott has repositioned and he's got some baby elephants. Well, um, happy that you've all got to spend some time with Jamie, but we couldn't resist calling you back for this tiny little elephant calf. And look at it, it's chewing on its own trunk there. And the trunks often are more of a hindrance than a help for the first couple of years of an elephant's life, as it just really gets in the way. And it's an incredibly complex tool, which is very difficult to get the hang of. And socks, cats, yes, that is an incredibly precious sight. And Steph has mentioned how cute that little elephant calf is. And I couldn't agree more with you guys. It looks like the, there's a youngster that's about to obscure our view of it. But let's, oh, here it goes. And Steph, you've also mentioned not only that they're very cute, but you can't blame the mothers for being so protective of their little bundles of joy. And exactly, what mother would not protect that little calf ferociously, as elephant cows can sometimes do? And now we've got another good view of it. And now watch how it tries to use that trunk. I saw a hilarious clip on Facebook the other day of a young elephant calf waving its head around with its trunk flaying wildly and it was trying to chase some cattle egrets that weren't in the slightest concerned for its presence and it's one of my favorite things to watch young elephant calves trying to bully various animals and it looks like we might be in luck it could be led straight past us its mother looks like it's turned course and is now feeding gently towards us and let's hope that our plan to allow them to approach us is going to increase our chances of getting a close-up view of them awesome stuff there's a gray go away bird calling in the background that you may be able to hear Quang. there we go there it goes again it's a little bit farther so you may be just hearing it faintly Hello to Rose in Pennsylvania. And you would like to know how many teeth, other than their tusks, will they be chewing on? And they've got quite an inter interesting dental structure, Rose. They have these large slabs of very angled teeth. And they're basically on a kind of railway track system. Unlike our teeth that are replaced from the bottom up, theirs are replaced from the back forward. Like I said, on a kind of a railway track system. And they will have six sets of molars in their life, obviously one in each quadrant of the mouth. So there are these four slabs, very large slabs of tooth in each corner of their mouth. And that's what they grind up their food with. Once their sixth and final set of molars has been worn down, well, that's usually actually the cause of the end of an elephant's life, and it'll slowly lose condition as it can feed on less and less vegetation. 
And because they are so large, it's only in very unique circumstances where they will actually be predated on. But it does happen, which is hard to believe, but there are some prides of lion in various parts of Africa that specialize in hunting these animals. Isn't it wonderful to get a context of size as Tebs has given you a great angle now of the calf sandwiched between two big cows? And it's a similar kind of growth period to that of humans. An elephant will reach kind of full size-ish at around 20. Not entirely, some will actually grow until, and continue to grow until they're much older, but they're more similar to us than most animals and have a similar kind of lifespan of around 60 years. So they can be related to us in, in many ways, I guess, in terms of age and growth. They also kind of rely on their parents for a similar period of time, roughly. Let's race you across to Jamie quickly because she's found a primate that we don't actually get to see very often. And if this calf does come any closer, we'll be sure to race you back. What's happening on Buyatera? Oh, guys, something that we don't get to see all that often, and that's a really nice, clear view Jamie, just, of this uh, vervet monkey. And guys, sorry, one of the landowners is just asking me for an update. If you bear with me one moment, I'll be with you very quickly. Oh, uh, you're sorry. Um, no updates for Buyatera. Ingwe tracks crossing into Buffel's Hook. Sorry guys, just wanted to give you a little bit of update, but um, let's cross back to Scott because the elephant's coming closer. Like, this should be okay. Sorry everyone, I've just been talking to the virtual reality camera. And the young calf and her mother has just popped out. Look at how cute that is. Come on, hold on to your mom's tail. It's something that you actually seldom see and it gets portrayed more in cartoons than in real life. But wasn't that awesome? What's interesting is you can see how the rest of the herd is almost corralled around that young calf, just making sure there's no chance that we're gonna cause any trouble. And they were all quite well spread out up until the point that that calf got past us and they're all in unison came in and made sure that everything was okay. And you can almost see them going up to it. Now look at that. The one female went and put her trunk against it. Oh, look there, you can see the, the calf from a previous. Look at this. That'll be an older calf born to the same mother that's being cheeky and trying to beg for some milk. And again, watch closely as this young calf tries to get the, to grips with its trunk. Jamad, and you'd like to know how old I think this little calf with its crinkled tail is, and I would say maybe around six months. I mean, it's so difficult to say, Jamad, unless you see an animal being born and follow it closely, you can never be certain, but in and around six months, possibly a little bit younger, and I'm, I'm guesstimating that due to the fact that it seems to have quite good control of its legs and body, whereas calves that are younger than that will probably be less comfortable on their feet. Look at that. Absolutely awesome. Small, medium, and large. And like I said, all part of the same family. And that one that's closer towards us now, a young bull, will be the son of that same cow, in all likelihood. And that's why it's sticking so close to its mother. And it would probably be around four to five years old and that's how often they give birth every three four or five years they will give birth as a general rule i'm just going to reposition quickly we're not going to be able to do too much i don't think we'll be able to get actually we will be able to get ahead of one more time. Let's just take this little sneaky fire break road. Try and loop ahead that way. Aha! 
Hans Ray, in Indiana, you've made a good observation and you'd like to know why is it that elephants will strip the bark off trees rather than simply eating the soft leaves? And different plants at different times of the year will, different, diff will yield different amounts of nutrients and different flavors. Um, depending on the individual plants. And the elephants are quite fussy feeders, and that's why they will target certain plants at various times of the year. So, hold on, this is gonna be a little bit bumpy. Um, and that's why they do it. Also, something important to remember, Desiree, is that, oh, this is embarrassing. My friend Brett, who's just arrived, and he'll be taking you on safari tomorrow, is going to be laughing at me now. He's going to be actually in hysterics in the final control room. <laughs> I can actually hear him laughing as Nikki's keying the mic. <laughs> and some of you remember, will remember just a couple of days back, I mentioned that he will be here. We are looking to expand our team. And you guys are going to have the privilege of being taken on safari with him tomorrow. A new face, a new person to bombard with questions, and I'm sure you are going to treat him just as well as you've treated me and all the other first-time drives. It can be quite a daunting experience. Apologies, though, um, as I lost focus on finishing off your question. And another big reason why elephants will feed on the bark as well as the roots of different trees is that that's the transport system from the roots which is essentially the bank of the tree where they can store precious nutrients and receive precious nutrients and minerals the bark is the transport system to get those nutrients from the roots to the leaves up at the terminal branches of the trees so what the elephants will be doing by stripping the bark is intercepting those nutrients on their way from the roots to the leaves. Good observation, and I really do love you guys sending through observations as well as questions. I'm told the whole of YouTube is in hysterics, and that's good. We enjoy people laughing whilst on safari, and <laughs> that wasn't my proudest moment. I don't know where that youngster is. Jennifer in Missouri is interested to know why is it that young elephants will have their ears folded flat against their heads? And I guess possibly it's got to do with the fact that they have had those ears flattened against their head for 22 months as they develop in their mother's stomach. So that's probably a large reason. And you'll maybe find that the muscles and cartilage will grow and harden in those ears as they become older, and that's when they'll get kind of better control of them. This youngster you can see, who's probably around, like I said earlier, four or five years old, has got complete control of its ears, and they're not hold flat against its head. But it's interesting because another viewer just a week or so ago also noticed that the elephant, young, young elephants like we've just seen will hold their heads flat, their ears rather, flat against their head. Oh, Tebs has spotted it. Well spotted, Tebs. And if we're just a little bit patient, I'm sure the rest of the herd is going to pop out along with this young calf on an open road in front of us. And look at that, you can actually see that they're overlapping a little bit, and that's never really the case with the older elephants. What you'll find is that extra flap that's sitting on top of the young elephant's head actually folds down. And sits flat against the actual ear. And Tibbs, if you can find an elephant that's facing away from us, oh, it's difficult for me, but even this one here on the left of your screen, if it opens its ear ever so slightly, you'll see that top flap of skin flaps down between the ear and the body. So that top portion of ear. There we go. So there you can see it clearly, whereas on the youngsters, that's still sticking up, and that's why they overlap to a degree. I'm just going to get on the radio quickly and update everyone about this herd of, of elephants. 
And even though they are about to cross over our northern boundary, they are going onto property where other people can drive around and they'll be able to enjoy this wonderful herd. I'm just waiting for a little gap on the game drive radio. And just to let you guys know, there's a little earpiece plugged into my right ear, and I'm listening to all of the guys chatting on the game drive radio, as well as listening to you guys and your questions you're sending through to me. So there's quite a lot going on in this right ear of mine. <laughs> Hello, Sharon Stewart. And it appears I may need to invest in a thesaurus as I'm overusing the word awesome. And you've said if you got a nickel for every time I said awesome, you'd be on a plane to Africa right now. And maybe we can start a Scott saying awesome for Sharon to get to Africa fund. And like you said, before you know it, you'll be here. Possibly you can charter your own plane. <laughs> okay, there's a gap on the Game Drive channel. So I'm just going to update the guys quickly. As I said that, somebody just jumped on the radio who's wishing one of the guys who's driving around a happy birthday. So I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. Yours, happy, happy birthday. There, my present to you is a herd of elephant with a small calf on Gauri cut line, Buffalo cut line. And I will hopefully find you a leopard before the end of drive. You wouldn't believe it. Joss is giving me an interesting update regarding a leopard. Because I had some tracks in the area where he spends a lot of his time driving around. Copy that. Thanks, Joss. Uh, well done. Uh, and that's great news. So he's not sure they. I can't be certain that it was the same leopard who we were tracking, but I did tell him about some tracks crossing into his property, and they did manage to find a female leopard, which is great news for him, especially on his birthday. He's besotted with leopard. We are going to now send you across to Jamie, and we're going to wait here in the hope that we will get one last view of these young elephants, or this young elephant calf, just before it crosses. very interesting we've got what you can see is one little piglet there's also a second little piglet just out of view and no sign of mom and at this age you should be she will always pretty much be in attendance they don't usually stray too far from their piglets because there's plenty out here that would make short work of a wild pork snack Oh, there's mom. I'm very curious to see. Oh, there she is. Hello. That's where you were hiding. Hello, girl. Oh, this is, for those of you familiar with the area, this is quite unusual for us to be able to see these warthogs nice and relaxed as they are with us. This is the female with the two piglets that lives around Leadwood. She's got a burrow somewhere between where we are now at Twin Dams and Leadwood Road. Hello, look at your little cheek fluff. Pretending to look big and scary. And speaking of big and scary, just before we came through here, we passed a very skittish warthog, as is normally the case, but it was probably one of the biggest warthogs I have ever seen in my entire life. Its tusks were absolutely enormous. I've been very impressed by the size of some of the warthogs that you get out here. And Vim and myself were just discussing what would happen if it were to be tackled by a leopard. I'm going to try and stay with our warthogs, but Scott's elephants are about to cross, so we're just going to pop over there for a few, for a few moments. <laughs> well, never easy when there's so much cuteness around. 
which camera to focus on and I'm glad you did go across to Jamie to see those little piglets because we've already had such great views of this little elephant calf. You just caught the end of it crossing into some very thick bush. So we tried our best to get you one last view, but not a train smash. Like I said, let's send you back to Jamie and I'm going to now leave this herd and go and see what else we can find. Lucky for us, our piglets are still here. As we're moving around and about the dead trees, trying to snuffle up all of the nice green shoots that they can. And I imagine for a warthog, this must be such a joy to have had plenty of rain last night. And then to be able to be faced with fresh green grass shoots in the next few days. And I've stopped at this mother before and I've said that she's been looking fairly thin. Her hip bones are sticking out ever so slightly, but her piglets are looking perfectly happy and healthy. Still two of them, as they were the last time I saw them. And already munching on solid food at only a couple of months old. I love the ridges of hair on top of their back. Much like the cheek fuzz that almost look like tusks, that ridge on the back makes them look bigger. I'm very gracefully wandering off down into the drainage line. You too. Don't stray too far. More togs in these sorts of areas would be always extra cautious. One last look at their mohawks. Whoopsie. Did you ever walk into a tree? <laughs> He bashed his nose. He wasn't really looking where he was going and he bashed his nose on the twig there. Shame. Unfortunately, I think that might be our last view, but I'll try and get us around. Let's see. to see a happy healthy animal and of course we get plenty of joy out of seeing what my opinion is helping an injured animal that we might see don't disappear guinea fowl what you're calling for the wonderful thing about this camera is we get to see so much in the way of detail Look at that incredible coloration. Sorry, Mercedes, I'll be with you in one moment. <laughs> I love the way that they walk. If you watch the way they walk, and I've spoken about this before, but for new viewers, as you watch guinea fowl moving, and they are fascinating to watch, you'll be able to have a look at the way that their legs move and see if it reminds you of anything. Because in fact, that is how they modeled the Tyrannosaurus Rex in Jurassic Park. So the film Jurassic Park, when they were creating the dinosaurs, were animating the dinosaurs, they modeled their walking and running style on the way that guinea fowl walk. And of course, our birds that we know today are direct relatives of the dinosaurs, or have come from the dinosaurs. What's fascinating about this if we look at this guinea fowl now, and in fact all of the bird species, their closest relative in terms of any other animal, for all birds, their closest relative out of any other animal, any of the others, is a crocodile. One of those fascinating little evolutionary chains that is extraordinary to think about. And not only that, a crocodile is most related to birds than is to any any other reptile, which is even more incredible to think about. It's all to do with a common ancestry that stretches back millions and millions of years. But I was in the middle of answering this question. I just thought I'd take a little stumble around Twin Dams, 
see if any of the water is collected around here. Mercedes, you were wondering whether or not, the answer is no, by the way, there's no water here. You're wondering whether or, or what my opinion is on helping an injured animal in the wild. It's always been a difficult one for me. I will say that I strongly believe in not intervening in a case where an animal has been injured under natural circumstances. That being said, a lot of the injuries that I feel absolutely should be addressed are the ones that are caused by humans, whether it's by snares, whether it's a stray bullet, whether it is um, being tangled up in some kind of litter. Fortunately, where we are, those sorts of cases are exceptionally rare and it's a area and coming to the wild. So I only agree with intervening where it's becomes our responsibility as I'm just coming out of the Okay, poor old Jamie on the rust bucket, not having much joy with the signal being transmitted from there, so we should all sympathize with that. It's a highly frustrating place to be in, as frustrating as it can be for you as well, of course. I think she's in pole position there in VM this afternoon. So it seems like our tech team have some work cut out for them as they all do. It's a never-ending job. It's like having little children looking after these vehicles. They require huge amounts of loving and tender care in order to keep working. Now, this is where the water monitor lizard attacked two frogs. And If we can't see it sunning itself somewhere, we could get lucky and see it just basking in the warmth after a good meal, but I can't seem to see it anywhere. Wendy, thank you very much for your thoughts as to which kind of rock monitor lizard you think it is. And I think that you spot on, I think that it is probably a Nile monitor lizard, judging by the fact that you said it's got quite a pointy nose. That, depending on its size plus coloration, they tend to have more yellow coloration, almost like a light lime, green, yellowy color to their body, as opposed to their, their, their rock monitor, their cousin, which you also get in this area, which has got less coloration, less yellowy, lime, greeny colorations, as well as a much more bulbous uh, head and robust head. Look at this strange little creature on the ground here. Hmm. Not right yet, Tibbs. Mm. Bet you weren't expecting to see this, were you? That is a rover. It's the latest addition to our arsenal of toys. And how cool is that? That's going to be some low angle incredibly close-up visuals hopefully in the near future and Alex our Russian genius is busy trying to tweak the rover into an operational form good stuff we're gonna continue on I'm gonna go and pick up a Brett from the final control and he's gonna hop on the back and learn what not to do as a presenter and like I said it's gonna be great for you guys to meet him and get taken around by someone who knows what they're talking about speaking of which that is about to happen as we send you across to Jamie. Enjoy. Oh dear, and it seems as though I was cut off in mid-sentence, but luckily we're back up and running again. I was in the middle of answering Mercedes' question about whether or not I believe in human intervention for a sick or injured animal. And I said that where human beings are responsible, I believe absolutely that that animal should be helped. Um, the difficulty really falls in drawing that line. Where exactly does human intervention begin or end? Because you can argue it in 
multiple ways, but definitely direct human influence play a factor in that respect. Traffic jam on Juma's southernmost, uh, southernmost boundary. Now, it's always a difficult line to draw. Hi guys, particularly if you're really fond of animals, you really like animals, the way that you've got to view it is that there isn't endless money, there isn't, aren't endless resources to go and help every sick animal. And not only that, but nature has been weeding out the weak genetics for hundreds of thousands and millions of years, long before we even had the ability to have any kind of influence on their lives. So you have to let it run its course in order for the genetics to be strong, the animal species to be stronger. It's all stuff that's been naturally occurring. And actually, we don't know nearly as much as we think we do. We think we're taking the correct moral decision. For example, providing water holes. I the terrapins. Two, two terrapins. Amazing how fast they enter into the puddles. So let's say, for example, the water holes in certain areas. Water holes bring animals that don't belong here or don't belong in those particular areas because that's not where they've evolved to be. What do you see, Vian? Timbuki. Right behind this dead tree. Look forward. Here's he? Well done, Willy. Wait, come back. I didn't see you. Now we had an amazing sighting <laughs> yesterday afternoon with a female steenbok that was incredibly obliging. We actually got to sit and watch her, her face and look at the flies around her eyes and her beautiful big eyes and eyelashes. Although usually most of what you see of them is a flash of disappearing fur as they race off to find safety in thicker and denser vegetation. But also it's a lot windier this afternoon than it was yesterday. Although she did take me by surprise. I couldn't believe how incredibly obliging she is. Here's something else. But yes, we don't realize how much influence we can actually have in a negative way. Even if the efforts are well-meaning, we're still learning a lot. I hear you little mongooses. I can hear little... I see you. Oh, check the snake. Check the snake. I don't see it. Yeah, on the right. Yeah. Oh, That's what they're alarm calling at. Oh, wow. That's what they're shouting at. I've lost the snake now. The snake's just gone. Where that mongoose is, it's gone in there. Oh. They're mobbing it. It's a, a, a rabbit as well. Oh, it's a scrub here. Let's just try and get a different view. It was a huge snake. And it was fast moving. That was so interesting. They were alarm calling not at me as I originally thought, but at a snake that was around here. Let me see if I can spot it again. Can you check? Can you check under the that where that branch goes where that fallen tree is? It disappeared through there. That was where I last saw it. It was basking in the sun, and I think it was a cobra, just by that brief glimpse that I saw of it, long cobra, at least four or five feet. That's why they were so panicked. I could hear them alarm calling, and I thought it was at me. Where did that snake go? I wonder if there's termite burrows there. It was an absolutely enormous snake. It moved too fast and in a way that wasn't python-esque. It wasn't a python. And I wouldn't be surprised if it were a, either a cobra. My initial thought was cobra. I wonder if it hasn't gone into one of their escape burrows somewhere there. They're all around me. All the little dwarf mongoose are around me now. 
They're looking very distressed, very tense. You can see that immediate reaction. You hear him squeaking? Keep checking in with the rest of the group. What's happening, guys? Where did he go? Absolute panic and pandemonium. There's the scrub hair that shot out. Also panicked, and I think that snake is still somewhere where that scrub hair was hiding. But the question is, has it gone into a burrow or a hole? I can't see it. Wow. So it was, it was a very quick movement that I caught out of the corner of my eye. The snake was basking next to the road and then shot towards the dwarf mongoose. And they're all, when I drove past, they were obviously alarm calling at the snake and I didn't realize. And then our presence as it came through caused the snake to move off in the way it did. I don't think it was hunting them. I think it was just basking, trying to warm up after the last few cold hours that we've had since the rain set in. But that was fascinating. I wonder, I'm still gonna keep looking. I want to just try and reposition, see if we can see it from a different angle. Checking the trees. And what we're gonna do, because I'm, I think that most of you would, may well have missed the movement of the snake through the dwarf mongoose sighting. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to replay that and it is going to be a little bit blurry apparently, but they have prepped a replay of it. So look in the top left corner and see if you can spot it now. While you were watching that, I hope you managed to see or get a glimpse of it. I've been trying to watch the behavior of the mongoose. I'm trying to see if maybe they give away where that snake went. And it's not unheard of for dwarf mongoose. For the smallest mongoose in the mongoose family, they certainly come with plenty of spirit. So keep your eyes peeled. See if maybe we can spot the snake again. Because it's not unheard of for dwarf mongoose to start to mob them. And I think that scrub hair also got the fright of its life. That was so unexpected. I'm trying to check the trees as well after my black mamba sighting. Whether there's any chance, whether there is any chance of it popping up. It was sort of a darkish gray brown in color. The size of it to me, there's a couple of possibilities. One is a cobra, by the way that it moves. Um, I don't think Mamba, and I have to be honest, I'm, I'm not certain. There was just something in its physical aspect that said to me, not Mamba. I think cobra, or the other alternative is quite a large mole snake. Now, a big mole snake can reach the same sizes of the cobras and the, um, and the black Mambas. They're actually completely non-venomous but they do look terrifying and they're very often mistaken for black mambas. And they've got solid fixed teeth. They're constrictors. They're not fanged snakes with venom that they can inject into their prey. And while we're sitting here, mongoose are still calling chip, 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 chip all around me, contact calling to each other. There was absolute mass panic. But I think the snake has moved off because I think if it were still in one place, I imagine that they would, if not necessarily have gathered near it, but, oh, sorry, not necessarily be mobbing it, but at least gathered in a sort of a, at a safe distance watching it. And I can't see them doing that. 
But it was so interesting to witness their behaviour. Where are you, Snake? Where did you go? I've mentioned before that there is a level of resistance that the dwarf mongoose has. There's a scrub hair. Good morning. Did we wake you up? Sorry, Darlene. I'll be with you in a moment. Just want to have a look at this. It's feeding, isn't it? Yeah. Did you get a bit of a fright, scrub hair? Imagine, fast asleep and a giant snake comes shooting through. Well, there's nothing, not much else to do other than have a meal. Yeah, midnight snack is the way forward. But Darlene, you were wondering if the mongoose are immune to snake venom, why then would they be so afraid of snakes? I might have given the wrong impression. They're more resistant or they have a certain level of resistance to snake venom. They're also very, very good at dodging the stripes. Sorry, I'm so distracted by them. They're shooting all over the place. It's squeaking all, all the time. And I can just hear them in the sort of, at a 360 sound from each way. It's very distracting. But Darlene, they're not completely immune. They're very adept snake hunters. There was a kudu something running here. Oh yes, a flash of, oh, a zebra. Oh. There's a zebra at the back there. Oh, it's all happening in this corner of Juma. One mongoose running across the road. Here comes the other. Oh, it's, they're moving their babies. That's what they're doing. They've got kits in their mouth. That's why they're so scared. Yeah, if you go up a little bit, Wildy, you should be able to see it coming through. I can't move now or I'm gonna scare her. I can't see her at all. She's, um, She's on the other side of this, this patch of bushes. She'll come out now, or she might come out now. That's why they're so stressed out. They've got youngsters with them. I wonder if the snake hasn't been quite possibly ready. There you go, there you go, there's movement there. She might pop out, there, she's there. I just saw her flash by out of the corner of my eye, carrying a youngster in her mouth. Come on, you can bring her out, girl. Nothing's gonna happen. So, as I said, one of them carried, or what looked to be carrying, what looked like a youngster. She's just come out now but not with whatever she was carrying, but she was definitely carrying a little mongoose in her mouth. And she must have left it there. They probably have some kind of secret, almost little. She's a bit more relaxed now. I'm gonna go forward, try and get, I'm not gonna drive right next to her because she'll go into hiding. She's hidden it in the stump of a fallen tree. I'm just gonna... There, there, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. There you can see she's carrying her baby again. Oh, this is incredible. All right, girl. Shame, little one. And a couple of you guys are amazed. Have you got it there? Yeah. So lots of you are commenting about the fact that they carry their babies in their mouths. And yes, socially awkward girl, they do. Shame, and that's why they're so stressed out. They're trying to protect them. And I don't know where the snake has gone. 
I don't think it's a threat to them anymore. Hello? Yes, we see you. It's okay. It's all right. Don't stress. You're not going to hurt your babies. Well done. Well done. contact calling he or she because they all take care of their of the youngsters in the group so it could be either a male or a female even though I keep calling it she shame little one see how on alert she is and again all of that 360 there it is that's the little baby she was carrying this is the most amazing dwarf mongoose sighting I've ever had hello guys it's okay oh shame <laughs> Little one. You stay hidden. It's okay. Now I was in the middle of answering Darlene's question about why would mongoose be scared of snakes. Well, apparently they've got little bundles of reason at the moment. They're not completely immune, Darlene. They can be resistant to certain types of venom, more so than we are. But they are not here. She's going to carry it. Desperately seeking the safety of darkness. She wants to move it. But she is still trying to get into contact with the rest of her group. So she wants to keep it with her so it doesn't do anything, but she wants to know where to move it to. You can see that immature immaturity to the shape of the face. Much rounder. Raisa, you voted Cobra. I agree. I, my initial thought was Cobra. And Darlene, yes, they, if they get bitten, they could actually be killed by the snake eventually. And that snake could well have been after these youngsters. When I said I thought it was basking, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was actively hunting the baby dwarf mongoose. That was why I picked up on the alarm calls. I can now hear a squirrel quite far off from where we are. I think that's alarm calling the snake. See how instinct acts here in the youngster to be in a dark crevice. Vim's just told me, and I've just seen it as I turned around behind me, there's another one relocating a youngster. That snake was obviously raiding their burrows. I'm almost certain of it. That's through left. Pardon? It's on the left. On the left, yeah. Oh, yes, there it is. Well done, Vim. Yes, yeah. Oh, there. There. There's another one with a baby. Vim spotted a run behind us. Carrying it in her mouth. Well done, Vim. 
dashing there. She's, she's run under that log, that fallen log there. Um, but to the right of where you are now. Yeah. This is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Panic and pandemonium in the Mongoose family. Now, the reason I'm now just sitting completely still, I'm also keeping my voice down, is so that we don't add to their stress. The fact that they're moving around behind us tells me that they're okay with us here. So we're not impacting on the sighting in any way. But they are just desperately trying to relocate each other after, after all this chaos. Hey, little one, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, shame. Kevin, you're absolutely right. These are incredible animals. Cheep, cheep. Looking up at the older mongoose who is above its head. Oh, I'm looking for comfort. I must tell you that you are so lucky. Where is that? Sorry, hold on one second. Sorry, Iggy. I'm just taking my earpiece out for one moment. Where is that school calling from? I can't hear it properly over all the squeaking mongooses. It's calling in that direction. Sounds like uh, one o'clock. Yeah, it's about one o'clock. Now, I wouldn't have thought the snake could have got there, but a bird of prey would also, because the dwarf mongoose will be listening to a squirrel alarm calling, so that's going to start to add to their panic in this situation. And when I said to you that the noise of their squeaks is distracting, it's like it's pinging in my peripheral hearing. In, everywhere, there she goes, she's still got her baby. She's just running through that gap. She's going to come across the road. I'm almost certain. That was incredible. So quick. Iggy, for a first mongoose sighting, this is incredible. This is the most phenomenal mongoose sighting I've ever had, certainly. As a dwarf mongoose sighting, this is very... And we must absolutely... It's an absolute testament to Vian's skill that he's managed to capture these moments because everything has happened in split seconds. Vicky, you were wondering about the puffed up tail on the adults and you were wondering if that is a panic or a response to stress and panic. And yes, I think it is. It's the most puffed up I've seen their tails. Shame, she's taken refuge somewhere there. Disappeared out of view for now. I wonder how many babies they had to move. So the wonderful thing about dwarf mongoose society is even though essentially should we go investigate what that school is shouting at i think maybe we should oh yeah that zebra and the zebra running you see, now that the mongoose have moved off they've relocated each other i noticed two of them squeaking across to each other so i feel comfortable to move and I also think it's a nice opportunity for us to remove ourselves from the equation so that we don't cause any further stress before they're all around us. I can see the mother and her baby now as I went past, but I'm just going to keep going just to reduce the stress of it. You're squeaking here now as well. What, are your, what is your purpose? Fascinating, fascinating sighting. So what I was saying is that Dwarf Mongoose Society, although generally only the alpha pair breeds and something similar to wild dogs, although others can breed at different times, generally only it's only the alpha pair. And usually 
The rest of the group is completely dedicated towards helping raise their youngsters. Is that a baby? Oh no, that's an adult. Well done, Billy. No, it's an adult. Just my sense of perception skewed. And I think they've decided that this is the new home because there's also one to the left there as well. On the other side of the, there we go. I wonder if these two are calling the rest of the family group to move them here. Such a brilliant method of locating your buddies. This is the one that's been calling the loudest. When you are only a couple of inches off the ground, it's a good way to be able to squeak and then listen back for responses. Yep, this is where they're gathering. Bit of aloe grooming there just to reunify their bonds. So yes, all of the mongoose will be dedicated towards helping raise the alpha's babies. And that will usually be between sort of and two to six would be the average number. Monique, you want to know roughly sort of how many youngsters they have. Usually about two to six on average. They have to, they're limited by the number of nipples that the females have. And as far as I know, females won't suckle the alphas, little babies. So they, they might help look after them and protect them. And very often the youngsters will babysit them, but they won't feed them. That's from what I know of mongoose behavior. But yeah, I don't know how many, I wonder how many babies. We know they had at least two in this group. What an incredible sighting. And Monique, I don't think they're going to continue to look for the snake. But I think they are moving their babies because of the presence of the snake. And I think you're right in asking that question as to whether or not they're going to have to move because the snake now knows where their babies are. Yes, I think they will have to move. I think that's why they've taken action now. Because they've lost sight of the snake, they don't know where it is. They know it knows where their youngsters are. And who knows, maybe they'd already tried to mob that snake and get it away from them. What an in interesting, fascinating glimpse into the complex lives that it, they're definitely one of my favorite animals to sit and watch. And while we've been sitting here, there's more of them slowly approaching, but they only approach from obstacle to obstacle. I think there is a baby. I absolutely agree. I think this is a, an emergency evacuation. And the panic came from where to make a decision about relocating. Oh, there she comes, she's made it in. So we were right, this is where they wanted to be. That was how the decision was made. There comes the second one. I've seen three babies go in there now. The first one I wasn't so sure of, but the other two definitely. Three babies so far. This is incredible to watch. There they all are, gathered nice and safely, all joining together again, and now playing with the older ones. You guys have been incredible. Well done. Got your babies safe. A rescue mission. I wonder if they're going back for more. Annie, I think you're right. I think there was a panic as to where they were all going to, because as we know, dwarf mongoose in an area have lots of little burrows that they use. And I'm keeping an eye on the, well, keeping a lookout in case some of them come running back. I think this individual at the base on the left is the one that made the decision. It got into position, it sat there and it called loudly, repeatedly to the rest of the mongoose. Now one of the youngsters has popped its head out, brave little creature. There they are, dashing around. Anna, you were 
wondering what the collective noun or actually the proper noun is for a baby mongoose. Now they're known as pups but it also depends on which book you read because I, I actually did it earlier, I called it a kit and that's because what, what I was first taught a baby mongoose was called but apparently the official name is pups. I've, I've always called them kits as a child and I think probably that stemmed from the ferrets because of course a baby ferret is known as a kit. But to give you a rough idea of perspective, the, there, there are some babies wandering around. What are you digging for now, huh? Are you feeling a bit better, a bit calmer? It's like you're having a whoops. Ah, uh, a little accident. Mm. Cute little ones. Oopsie-daisy. And still that sentry stands strong on the left. Incredible. You all, have you all taken a moment to have a communal relief of tension in one corner of the den? Because that's what it appears to be. There, that's the toilet. Okay, kids, there's the loo of the new house. <laughs> Incredible insight this has given us in one brief sighting into the way that they operate. Now Iggy, you were wondering, and this is, you must you must know how lucky you are, Iggy, to have had this as your first dwarf mongoose sighting. It is incredible. But you wanted to know if I think maybe the mongoose, some of the mongoose chased that snake across the road and the rest rescued the kit, uh, the pups. Iggy, I'm not sure entirely what happened. That's one option. That sheer size of that snake, especially if it was a cobra, suggests to me I'm not sure. I'm in two minds about what happened. It's a possibility, absolutely, that they chased and the rest went to go collect the pups. That's generally what mongoose do. They are more than capable of that level of group coordination. The other part of me that's starting to rethink through that sighting is wondering whether we didn't actually disturb the snake cause as we drove past, cause it to move and that's when they actually saw it. And that's why there was so much panic because immediately, some mongoose were running around looking for the snake. The rest of them started coming out with the babies there. So that's one of two options. One, they were unaware and we came around and then they saw the snake move and suddenly realized it was there. I said I heard alarm calls. I heard them squeaking. Dwarf mongoose squeak. I don't speak dwarf mongoose. It, they could have been alarm calling at us and then we disturbed it and then it turned into snake alarm calls. Or it was that they were chasing it and then I heard their alarm calls from that. A supposition. I don't know what happened beforehand. Both of those are possibilities, but I'm very happy that they managed to get their little ones to safety. And I wonder, some of them are dashing back. I wonder whether they're not running to go and fetch some more. But this one has been the sentry, or I don't know what you'd term it. It hasn't moved from its post. It's been sitting there the entire time, squeaking, calling, letting everyone know where home base is. Here comes another one. They were going back for more. Well done, Viam. Oh, they're so fast. Okay, that's number four. Or at least number three, but I think number four that we've seen dash in there. I saw one first out of the corner of my eye. Now they love these tangled up termite mounds. Wildebeest is on the ball, keeping an eye on what's happening behind me. Thank goodness, because you spotted them all coming dashing in. But they, yes, they love these little, there's another one, no, it's not carrying a baby, just another one running in. My word, I feel like my neck's been rotating on speed wobbles, 
trying to keep an eye on everything that's going on. It's insane. <laughs> I thought you needed eyes in the back of your head for hyenas. I hadn't tried f sitting through a dwarf mongoose sighting like this one. And A, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, A as in A-E, you want to know if mongoose can climb, climb trees. They can, they are very agile little creatures, but they generally don't. They're not really built for climbing straight up branches. They're not like squirrels that are slightly more adapted in the, in the positioning of their toes. So squirrels have three toes that sit at the top of the foot that provide for that extra strength of grip for a vertical climb. Dwarf mongoose, although they're agile and they often move between stumps and fallen trees, generally don't climb up vertical stumps. So I've never seen a dwarf mongoose higher than a, the size of a fallen stump. Imagine what they're feeling now. <laughs> and apparently Safari Dean and I were on the same page when we mentioned this den and it was how I thought that filming hyenas were complicated. Absolutely, Safari Dean says it's like a mini version of the hyena den. I wonder if they got all their babies out. I really hope so. I can't help but hope so. You shouldn't choose side, but it's very difficult. Dwarf mongoose are one of my favorite animals. Hey, you're cute. Yes. <laughs> Make sure you mark your new den thoroughly. Dwarf mongoose are not content unless they have piled their dung and urine all around the entrance to the den which in now that i think about what's just happened seems like a very poor evolutionary tactic actually let us make our sleeping area as smelly as possible so just to give you a rough perspective of scale a dwarf mongoose is about an adult dwarf mongoose is about this long now we're getting to see them on super zoom they're about this long the babies are probably about this long they're about that high Babies are probably about that high. Really, really tiny, tiny little creatures. And I think all is settling down now. The adults, one more. <laughs> that was number five. That just dashed in there. This is a relay rescue mission of note. All gathering together, all chipping happily. Oh, I really hope they all made it out. They're now racing around the den. <laughs> Lee Wilson, I'm in complete agreement after that sheer show of courage from the adults in protecting their youngsters. They have had a really tough afternoon. I really hope that they've all survived this. Hello. Yes, have a good scent, Mark. Have a good rub. Mark it as your own, as your second house. Hey, baby, make it familiar for the youngsters. Maybe that's why they do it. So that if the youngsters get lost, they know where to go. Because look how that baby's sniffing where that adult scent marked. Sure. I'm not sure about the rest of you, but I can safely say I have learned more about dwarf mongoose than I ever, ever expected to in a sighting like this. Absolutely phenomenal. And just think, I nearly drove straight past and ignored the calls of the mongoose calling next to the road. Amazing. Is there more? Why are you guys still dashing off? We're on number five now. I wonder what the maximum litter size for a dwarf mongoose family is. I don't know off the top of my head.
Oh, Eric, who is watching in Virginia Beach, he was saying that where you live, um, there were no snakes, and that you were told that the imported population of mongoose had actually killed them. And you're wondering if it's true that they eat snakes. And they do. I mean, the tables could well be turned. Little dwarf mongoose like these would definitely target not the smaller species of snake, something like a centipede eater would be a quick meal for the sharp, fierce mongoose teeth. And the larger mongoose species are actually capable of taking on much bigger snakes. In general, though, the famous story, I think it was of Ricky Tiki Tavi, the mongoose that used to tackle cobras in, I think it was, was it India? It was, I think it was India. The famous story about Ricky Tiki Tavi. Those are all more cases of snakes mobbing cobras. So a group of mongoose like, no, let me, let me try that again, mongoose mo mobbing cobras. So a family like this one, they would try and scare away a big cobra like that. And that cobra was, if it is a cobra, was huge. They wouldn't set out to try and kill it or eat it or anything like that. All they'd try and do would be to scare it away long enough to move their babies out of their reach, out of its reach. That's pretty much all they would do, essentially defend their den site. Well, I think it's all settled down and Scott has found one of the cuckoo species to show you. Okay, now, it sounds like you guys have been having a fascinating time with Jamie. Sighting of a lifetime, really. So you're all hugely privileged. I'm trying to find you a better view of a cuckoo. It's the cousin of the cuckoo that we saw on the Sunrise Safari, and it's called a striped or levalian cuckoo. I'm just going to, sorry, Tebs, I'm just going to try and go forward. I don't think we're going to get a good view. You can see its wing flittering in the, behind that foliage, and I think it there's some kind of a mating dance, perhaps. There's two of them here dancing about in this tree, and it's not going to be a youngster begging for food because they are raised by other parents, a different species, being a cuckoo. It is a mating dance. I think we could get incredibly lucky here. And if we get to see these cuckoos mating, this will be another once-in-a-lifetime sighting. Look, they're going to go for it. I think they could even be mating right now. They are. They are mating. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that that would be possible. Absolutely phenomenal. They are usually such shy and secretive birds, all of the cuckoos, and I think it's because of their dodgy, shady side of life, the fact that they lay their eggs in other birds' nests and allow them to raise their chicks. And that's why I knew from the beginning that it's not going to be a chick begging for food, because any cuckoo chick will be begging for food from a completely different species. In this case, it's the starlings that the levalians or striped cuckoos parasitize, as far as I'm aware. And isn't it wonderful? You've been looking at baby dwarf mongoose with Jamie, and now mating cuckoos, making some more babies for Juma and surroundings. Now, the name is the Levalians cuckoo, also known as the striped cuckoo, formerly. And here I've got a picture in the book, and I'll be able to show you the differences quickly between um, the Jacobin cuckoo, which we saw this morning, which looks very similar, but it's got a white chest, and the Levalians cuckoo, which you've just seen now, which has got a striped chest. Now, apologies, I've got the wrong cuckoo, it's the great spotted cuckoo that uh, parasitizes the starlings, and the Levalian's cuckoo parasitizes in this area strictly the arrow-marked babbler. In other parts of the park, they will parasitize the other babblers that you get out here. So what we've just seen there is a future arrow-marked babbler's unwanted baggage being made. <laughs> I wish I could remember the name of the person who got up to 101 birds this morning with the Jacobin's cuckoo. Oh, the problem 
is, with having thousands of people on your vehicle daily, it's hard to keep track of everyone. But there was one of you that got to their 101st bird on their bird list this morning with the Jacobins cook. And imagine if 102 is Levaliance and a screenshot of them mating. Now, the interesting thing about the viewer who has got 101 birds is they've got a screenshot to go along with every single sighting. And isn't that marvelous? So I hope you're watching. And if you are, please let us know your name again. And apologies for forgetting, but this little skull of mine is very sieve-like and doesn't retain too much information for long periods of time. Like I was saying though, before we got distracted by those mating cuckoos, the sighting that you've been having with Jamie ha has been a once in a lifetime sighting. And I'm very, very envious of the incredible moments you've shared, but the good news is at least I'm going to be able to watch through the highlights and interesting speculations like Jamie says is it just uncanny timing that you got there at the perfect moment as the mongoose the mongooses discovered the snake possibly raiding their den or was it that you flushed the snake into the mongooses and then all hell broke loose who knows, but the end result was a good one and I'm very, very happy for all of you. Ah, uh, well, the girls in final control have done a good job of remembering it was Marilyn in Montana. So if you're watching, I hope you've got 102 down. Get an update from you shortly if you are in fact watching. That is the tricky thing, I guess, for a lot of you is that if you miss out on any of the drives, you miss out on the risk of missing such cool things happening. Um, that's exactly the trap we want you to fall into. And I can't keep saying enough that the more people that join in, the more places we're going to be able to take you to, the more toys we're going to be able to get, and the more fun we're going to be able to have. And if any of you are watching for the first time, it's important that you know that this is happening live right now. It's hard to believe, and if you don't believe me, send through a tweet using the hashtag Safari Live or an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And who knows, maybe I'll do some kind of a terrible dance on the hood of the vehicle for you. Also, let us know where you send in your messages from, because it's always nice to know where in the world you're watching. Hmm. Steph from Switzerland, I'm going to halt the vehicle in order to answer the question you, that you've just sent through. You would like to know if there's ever been a situation that's unfolded here on Safari Live that I wish I had have been involved in, either when I was on leave or when I was on drive but simply in the wrong place. And immediately uh, sighting pops into mind. And Brent and myself were out one afternoon and he was following the Inkahuma Pride of Lions, the Pride of Lion that are just to the west of our, our border at the moment and hopefully will be back tomorrow. And back then, I think there were seven or eight lions in the proud. Now there's only five. And back then, there was also a young male called Junior. He was about three years old, I'm guessing, at the time. And they were stalking some prey. Nobody could see, including Brent, what was actually being stalked. And the message I got through from Nikki in the final control room was that the lions are stalking something. Brent's standing by in the vehicle. And I was parked standing by at Twin Dams, which was probably about... 800 meters to a kilometer away from where Brent was. And I knew where Brent was, obviously, because I'd been relayed that information. And I'd parked, I was waiting, stopped listening, possibly for alarm calls. I'm not too sure why I was stationary. And all of a sudden, I heard the sound of a buffalo in distress. And I knew that the Inkahuma Pride were on the back of this buffalo with Brent right there. I dropped the clutch and sped over there in absolute rapid speeds in order to try and capture 
some more different angles and also get in on the action and got there just in time, literally as the Inkuhuma Pride brought that buffalo to the ground. And it was great that we did get to share the different angles, but Brent was definitely there for the quality moments, and it was an incredible chase, an incredible moment, definitely the best uh, kill that we've captured since we've been filming by a long way. The only other kill that's, or decent kill, that's been captured start to finish was probably of Karula, female leopard, catching a baby impala that had been stranded uh, Actually, the, the, the leopard had killed the impala's mother the day before. Interestingly, that very same morning, the leopard had lost its remaining tiny little cub to a hyena. That evening, she killed an impala. Nobody saw it. And we were actually looking for her the next day and found her in the area where she had lost her cub. She was there calling for it, hoping that it was still around. And she actually, once she had given up, she, she led us back to an area where she had killed the impala and hoisted it up into a tamboti tree. And we returned there that afternoon only to find the baby impala stranded waiting for its mother who was never going to return. And the impala, the baby impala let out a few meh, meh, trying to call its mother. And in results, it got the leopard pouncing on it. Essentially, it was probably a good thing for the baby impala because it put it out of its misery. It required a lot of uh, help from its mother still and uh, further raising. So. Uh, the leopard killed both the impala and its little baby and quite interesting how that kind of circle of life happens so quickly in terms of circle of emotions of everyone feeling hugely sorry for the leopard who lost its cubs but within 24 hours it had killed an impala and its and its baby so interesting stuff and Steph good question I hope you liked the old story and hopefully it won't be too long before any of us are involved in, a, in, in an epic sighting or a takedown because we don't get them that often good we're going to send you back to Jamie as we continue our search for anything interesting. See you later. I know that Scott was chatting about that amazing Nkuhumo hunting buffalo sighting that Brent had and we just happened to stumble across some buffalo gentlemen to show you. Although he was being a lot more camera friendly a little bit earlier. Also enjoying the new green shoots that are coming through. You can see his tongue sneaking forward to grab at the grass roots. And you never know what stories these Duggar boys or old buffalo bulls have to tell. This one's got a particularly broken tail, although that tail's about to disappear behind the branches. Show us your tail, boy. Nope, no, I'm going to put it right there where you can't see it. He's embarrassed about his crooked tail. And so many of them really do have those bent up and clearly tails that have been broken at some point in their lives, either by predator, attacked by predators or by maybe some kind of collision during a fight with another buffalo. Very few creatures out there. And in fact, I'm just wondering if this one actually it has the tip to its tail. It seems to be hiding. He's broken off his horn at one point. Also, most likely during a collision with another buffalo. Just swish your tail, boy. Oh, no, there's an end. It's just also a little bit crooked. So for new viewers, this is one of the most ferociously powerful animals out here. They might look like cows, but they definitely shouldn't be treated as such. Particularly these old dugger boys, or mud boys as they are known. They like to find mud wallows to go and rest in during the day. And they like to hide from our cameras as well. Good boy. Now, you usually see these gentlemen either on their own or in slightly smaller herds. But buffalo herds themselves can go anywhere from a couple of hundred right up to a thousand or even four thousand in some cases. That's generally the breeding herds of females with some of these older gentlemen following behind.
guys. I don't know whether it's the wind playing havoc with my radio communication, but just so you know, if you are sending through questions on these buffalo, that they might not reach me. So I'm not ignoring you, I promise. It's just one of those things that happens every now and again. I don't think wind can actually blow radio waves away, but maybe I'm just in a little bit of a tricky area. Radio waves work in mysterious ways. And this is true. Radio waves do work in very mysterious ways. As do buffalo bulls and apparently mongoose as well. But I'd just like to put out a warm welcome to any new viewers that might be joining us for the first time. Don't forget we are coming to you live, which makes what's happening in front of you even all the more exciting because it's absolutely unplanned, unscripted, unedited, pure, raw wildlife at its absolute finest. And if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like to send through to us, don't be afraid. Either do it on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email it through to questions at wildearth.tv. And recently, we've also been picking up questions from YouTube as well. So feel free to send through anything that you'd like to ask us. Don't be shy. We don't expect everyone to be animal experts of the wildlife of South Africa. And I think it's a challenge with a C. Challenge, you are one of these new viewers that I was talking about. A big welcome. It's fantastic to have you on board with us. And please feel free as well to let us know where you are from and where you discovered us from as well would also be some really interesting information. But Challenge, you wanted to know what animals you could see in this area on safari. Well, Challenge, I'm sure our regular viewers will jump in with some of the more exciting ones I may have forgotten. But we see leopards, we see lions, we see cheetah, we see elephants, buffalo, wild dog, hyena, those African animals that have made this place so incredibly famous as a wildlife haven. And then, of course, over 300 species of birds that you could swap, and many of our, or spot, sorry, not swap, you can't swap birds, please don't swap birds, um, that you could spot, and many of our regular viewers actually have started bird lists. Insects galore, some insects I don't even know the name of yet, I'm still getting to know all of them, they're just so many different varieties. You could see all the little mammals, like the little dwarf mongoose that we saw which can never be discounted because they are some of our most exciting sightings. What else could we see that I've forgotten? I mean, there's so many things, I can't even begin to list them. But so that you know where we are, we're in the northeastern corner of South Africa. And we even do walks on occasion where we get to see, get up close, really up close and personal with some of the smaller creatures, the more, the things that we sometimes forget about and ignore, but carry their own beauty and their own drama within those sightings. I mean, even today, for example, on Bushwalk, I've encountered snails that I've never seen before. Steph has never seen before in however many years he's been working in the bush and it's prompted me to do some more research on the various mollusks of the Sabi Sands. Something I never thought I would find as fascinating as I did this morning. wondering why we were on foot and not driving around in the vehicle and it's it's an occasion for us to show you things that we wouldn't get to be able to spot from the car we actually spent i mean in that walk we spent we did we covered maybe a kilometer in distance barely that and we just found so many fascinating insects with all of these incredible adaptations to the world that they live in some of them, the fact that we'd never seen them before, that Steph, with his years and years,
years, decades almost, of experience that the bush has never seen before. And just for challenge with a C, to show you one of the bird species that you're going to be seeing commonly on these safari drives, that is an ox tecker. And in fact, that is a red bull. Ooh, is that a sore spot? Ouch. Ooh, ow. And this is where the ox pickers, where they usually do the animal a service, can actually seriously, oh, that's making my skin go tingly, can actually do them a serious disservice. Because although they pick off the ticks and the parasites in the animal, they'll also worry at injuries and keep them open. And that's what this one's doing to this poor buffalo. Oh, I've got the shivers at the thought. That's a deep injury on that buffalo. Jen, Jen B, you have just given me the perfect explanation, one I would never think. Oh, look, there's the kinky tail again. Jen B, you're a genius. So Jen B is a formal cattle farmer and has said that she's willing to bet that those broken tails almost always come from when the buffalo is lying down and another buffalo steps on it. Perfect, brilliant. This is why I love Safari Live, because you get people with experiences like that to provide an explanation for something that I would never have thought of. Why didn't that cross my mind? Jen B, you're a genius, and I'll never ever forget that piece of information. He's walking away with it. Oh, he knocked it off. That's a pity. He was wearing a, a tree hat, but unfortunately knocked it off right at the last minute. Shame, good luck, Buff. I hope those ox peckers leave you alone. Now we're gonna carry on and have a look around and find you more wonderful things to show both our older and our newer viewers. And in the meantime, let's join Scott on the back of his vehicle while he does a river cruise. Well, welcome to one of my favorite places on Juma, the Muwati Riverbed. I hope you're still with us. Our antenna just fell over, but you should be. <laughs> And the joy of being in these sandy riverbeds is that these vehicles, when put into a low range, will drive themselves. And I don't even have to touch the accelerates. And once we get into these little trucks, I won't even need to touch the wheel as we drive along. Quite great, and that way I can focus my attentions on you. Although I am going to jump back down because there's an interesting story that I'd like to tell you about what happened right here not too long ago now in the end of november december uh, last year we had a big cat week a lot of you would have discovered safari live during that big cat week and between a morning safari and a afternoon safari myself james nikki and the two trackers that we had employed for that week came out in search of any content that we could try and secure for the afternoon drive and we were lucky as Nikki and I were ready, getting ready to head out from our house, Inga's house. We heard monkeys alarm calling, rushed down into this riverbed, just quite a lot further upstream, and found a big male leopard called Mvula. And then we started following him as he crisscrossed through this riverbed until he eventually got to here. And it was probably about 1, 1, 1, 1 p.m., middle of the day, that he arrived into this area. And he was up on this bank. Okay, so he, he'd been coming downstream and then he walked up onto the bank close to this Tamboti tree, this big tree growing out of the ground. <laughs> well, that's usually where trees grow out of, I guess. And um, he stopped there and he heard something and he looked across in this direction and then he went back on his original trail, which took him through here, back into the riverbed, and then he started moving into this fallen down tree. And he was moving quite slowly and intently, sniffing, and he eventually kind of moved through, popped in, under here, and then he went under here, 
and eventually he kind of pounced on something and then he popped his head up with a rock bonnet to lizard that he fed on just behind us. And isn't it phenomenal that his senses were so good and so acute that from up on the bank there, the other heard or saw that monitor lizard, went down and managed to catch it. A nice easy meal for a big male leopard. Probably wouldn't have filled them up too much, but it was fascinating to watch. Once he had fed on it, he continued moving down the riverbed and then eventually lay up. And we then called Peter Pretorius onto the scene. He was in the vehicle for that afternoon safari. And you wouldn't believe what happened after we had spent six hours with that male leopard during a blisteringly hot day, following him on foot, following him on the vehicle. We followed him on foot when the bush got too thick for us to follow him in the vehicle. And we miraculously managed to stay with him through this dense, dense riverbed. And 15 minutes before we went live to Nat Geo TV, he outfoxed Mr. Pretorius. Gone. No more leopard. <laughs> so, just goes to show how luck and timing can be critical when on safari, regardless of how hard you may try to stay with animals and find animals. Now the racket you can hear is Aramark babblers, and these are the same birds that are going to be parasitized by the cuckoos that we saw mating earlier. And who knows, maybe some cuckoos are busy trying to pop an egg into the babbler's nest, hence the commotion. Anyway, we're going to continue up the riverbed, slowly making our way towards the hyena den. We should be there in 10 minutes, and we're going to send you across to Jamie quickly for a quick update there. <laughs> I'm sorry to drag you away from Scott, it won't be for too long. I just wanted to show you the one and only time I've ever seen a marabou stork look glorious and dignified. And that, of course, is because it's purely in a silhouette. Not a bird we've actually seen for a while, so a wonderful treat as it performs dance moves to try and stay on top of this dead tree. And for those of you uncertain as to why I'm saying it's the only time it's ever looked beautiful. They are definitely not the most attractive of birds, but it makes for an incredibly striking image sitting silhouetted against the setting sun. Awesome image. I don't want to take you away for too long. I'm going to send you back so you can enjoy the rest of the drainage line drive with Scott and I'll catch up with you later. Welcome back. It sounds like you got some wonderful images of a marabou stalk. I wonder what it was doing there on Philemon's cut line. Unlikely place to, to see a marabou stalk. Usually they around water holes or around carcasses, interestingly enough. Oh, Marilyn Montana. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that you are watching, but I'm sad that you have already got the Levalian's cuckoo on your bird list, but you haven't seen them mating before, so you can add that to the Levalian's cuckoo part of yours list. Seen mating. Exceptionally rare. How lucky am I? <laughs> um, that is the joy of Safari Live and the fact that you can, not just for three or four days or a week or two, come and join us in Africa, but daily. By investing time with us, you see these little moments of magic. Yay, a new viewer all the way in India. Hello, Babu. And you would like to know what safety precautions do we take in order to make sure the wild animals don't cause any trouble with us or don't cause any harm to us? Oh. Babu, I'm coming up onto higher ground, Babu. I've had to leave the riverbed for you so that you can hear what I'm saying. Because it's low-lying, sometimes the signal gets a bit shaky in there. So, Babu, I think you can hear me more clearly now. And you would like to know what safety measures we will 
form in order to make sure we don't come unstuck with any of these wild animals. And because this reserve has been running as a photographic safari destination for about 60 odd years now, the animals have become accustomed to us as humans, provided as long, well, provided we behave in a civilized and orderly manner. And all of the guides that work in this reserve will be well trained. It's quite a, a well-known reserve in South Africa and most of the camps within this reserve are some of the most luxurious and well-known and best-run camps in the country if not in Africa. So there's a high level of guiding here as a general rule and because the guides know what they're doing and they respect the animals and treat them the right way and understand their behavioral signs and body language, the animals and us have got a very good relationship. So we don't really have to worry too much about the wild animals causing trouble with us, but of course, we, we don't do anything silly. You don't sleep with your doors open at night because that would be an open invitation for a hyena to come in and eat you. Um, and we are very cautious when we're on foot out here so as to make sure that we don't force an animal, put an animal in a scenario where it feels so scared that it feels like attacking you as its only escape route. Even though these things can happen and can happen to the most experienced of guides in Africa, you can get lucky, of course, there are risks involved. But thankfully, the animals out here don't see us as a major threat and therefore usually don't want to cause any trouble with us. And what's important to remember is that even wild animals that have the ability to kill us very easily, because our brain is smarter than theirs, we can sometimes outfox them by standing your ground. You're going to make an animal think twice about attacking you. And that would be the same with humans. If somebody half the size of me stood their ground and started wagging their finger at me as I came charging up to them, I would think, hang on. What does this guy know that I don't know? Is this a kung fu specialist or does he have a knife in his back pocket? You know, there's that kind of mental warfare that we can play with the animals and outfox them mentally, not physically. Well, this is going to be wonderful. I'm not going to spend too long here because I do want to get to the hyena den, but look at this golden afternoon sunlight bathing this herd of impala. And what's interesting is that this male is here simply for his ego. Looks like he's not quite fully grown, nearly. Um, well, I think his horns could twist out a little bit more. But he's here at a random time of year to be associating with ladies and their young lambs because the rutting season is long gone and it'll be a few more months until they start rutting and competing for the females again. So they don't have a social structure like that of zebra where the males will compete throughout the year for their is ladies. So that's why I say he's here just to boost his ego. Good. Babu, it's wonderful to have you with us and hopefully it won't take long for us to come and start doing some safaris in India. Imagine that. You've got some wonderful wildlife in your country and very jealous of your big cats, the tigers. Also, you've got massive leopards in India. Okay, well, Babu and the hundreds, if not thousands, of other people also are joining us on this afternoon safari. You guys are about to jump on board with Jamie and another herd of herbivores. Oh, look who we found. This year's stock of baby wildebeest, or wildebeest calves. All sitting, having a nap, and in fact, this little one still hasn't lost its umbilical cord. Still dangling down there. Oh, is it nap time for growing wildebeest with your horns just starting to poke through? So for new viewers, we've actually been following this wildebeest herd from the females all being pregnant right up until the point that these calves were born around the end of last year, around December last year. And in fact, in one case, even recorded and showed live one being born. We missed the actual moment as it flopped out completely, but we saw it, the labor start, we watched as the head appeared, and then we watched it stumble to its feet and take its first few steps and have its first drink of life. And now they are so big. And look, this is what the adults look like. So you can see there's a vast difference. 
the common misperception is that a wildebeest is related to a cow. Although it is related, it is an antelope species. So just like those impala that you were with Scott with the, a little bit earlier, they are antelope as well, part of the Hartebeest tribe. And this little youngsters take on a much lighter brown color than their adult mothers, but already on solid food at not even two months old or maybe about two months old now. They're already sitting ruminating like little adults and already starting to go dark as well, particularly around the face, around the ears. There were 10 of them. I haven't been able to count all of them because they're not in the clearest sighting. Have a look at its pupils. Just a quick aside. Did you know that wildebeest pupils were horizontal? They're almost horizontal squares. Interesting. And the horns that are starting to peek out above the head, those are bone. So it takes them a while to start depositing first sort of cartilage and then strengthening it with bone, all wrapped in a keratin sheath. So the same material your fingernails are made out of to protect it. And they start to grow from growth points in the head. And even though they're spending time oh look who's behind them there's some zebra there as well you can just see the flash of black and white stripes at the back and even though they're off on their own and behaving like little adults and munching like little adults we did hear one of them calling for its mother <laughs> and socks cat <laughs> You were saying that you think you have to have eagle eyes to be a guide, to spot the sort of things we do and that you can't see two feet in front of you. It's actually something you can practice, although I've noticed some people are naturally better at it than others, but it's, it's about being aware of the stuff going on in your periphery, but also practice. You get used to looking for certain things. Your, your eyes get very familiar because we drive around so much. You get very familiar with what an ordinary bush landscape looks like. And the minute something is out of place, your eyes pick up on it, or your ears, or even your sense of smell. And the more time you spend out here, the better at it you get. It's the same with walking. When you walk in the bush for the first few times, you spend a lot of time looking at your feet, trying to make sure you don't fall over sticks. Eventually, it gets to be second nature to actually walk with your head up and just drop your eyes or watch the ground with your peripheral vision so that you don't fall down. It doesn't always work as we all well know um, sometimes you do fall over or you step on a stick and it shoots up and smacks you that's happened to me once or twice but for the most part it's just time spent and experience and i always say to first-time guests when you're out here and you're looking for something what you need to do is imagine your brain like a spotlight and if you just relax and let it do the work for you you don't specifically look for say a leopard or specifically look for a lion you just relax and your brain will tell you when something is off, something is different. And it's, that's what you're looking for. It's like a light flashing back at you. Oh, it looks as though, speaking of things that look different, I wonder if this means we're going to be getting more rain. This weather has been so unpredictable. There's patches of blue, but this cloud looks so incredibly heavy. It's actually beautiful in its own way. I'm sort of hoping against hope that maybe tonight we might get a little bit more rain. It'll be good for all of the animals, and it's also a relief for us. And that includes our wildebeest and our zebra families. And the socially awkward girl, you were wondering where, why it is that wildebeest and zebra always associate together. A couple of things there. Usually antelope species or the, the sort of general game species is often associate with each other because 
more eyes or better than less eyes. It's particularly seen or it's particularly prevalent with wildebeest and zebra because they like the same species of grass, but they like different parts of the species of grass. So a zebra, as a bulk feeder, has a hindgut fermentation and it can quite happily eat the top coarse parts of the grass. But the little wildebeest, with their slightly more nimble lips, tends to favor the lower down shoots. So the zebra can come along and mow for the wildebeest, and the wildebeest can come behind and have a quick nibble at the slightly greener, more delicious shoots at the bottom. That's why you often see zebra and wildebeest together, or one of the reasons you often see zebra and wildebeest together. There's also, I think, the fact that they are quite a similar size, which seems like a bizarre thing to say, but I think in terms of association, it makes things a little bit easier. There's no, you know that the one animal doesn't present a threat to you or your youngsters. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, seven. And eight, nine, and ten. Bravo, wildebeest. Well done, as they dash off after their moms, because although they're big enough to be sitting and ruminating all on their own, they still want some time with their mothers. 10 wildebeest calves have made it to the age where they have horns sticking up. That's quite an impressive achievement. This herd has done very well. African welcome to Mark in Southampton. Mark, you were wondering if we radio collar our big cats. I'm just going to find us a nice position to look at these wildebeests before I carry on with an answer. And I think that might be our. Me, why are you met me? Why are you contact calling, boy? Me, mom, where are you? <laughs> me, that's the sound the wildebeest calves are making. So Mark, you were wondering about radio collaring big cats. In this particular area that we're in at the moment, I don't think we have any big collared or collared big cats. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen within the area that we are in though, because of course, we're in this vast wilderness area. It's absolutely huge and unfenced, and we get to explore our own little corner of it. And as it happens, the big cats that have this as part of their territory, so, for example, the famous Karula, the Queen of Juma, the female leopard that we so often see, or one of the lion prize. It just so happens that they're not being researched at the moment by one of the reputable organizations that do research in these sorts of areas. That being said, because it is open, there's no reason why one couldn't wander through with the collar on it, particularly in the case of cheetah, as there are certain organizations that collar cheetah in order to get a little bit of a more accurate idea as to their movements, maybe their territories and home ranges. And cheetah in particular tend to cover big distances. So although none of our big cats that we know of that move through here have collars, that doesn't mean, Mark, that you won't be seeing them. You'll just have to stay tuned and find out because it's fantastic that you stumbled across our stream online. We love to have as many viewers as possible from as many corners of the globe as we can reach. Because the more people we tell about this wonderful world, the further the reach goes in terms of the value of this area and its conservation efforts. Well, we've had a nice time spent with our wildebeest farms and Scott has found another magnificent king of the skies to show you. So, we've got a Warburg's eagle here. I'm sure Tibbs is about to just tweak the iris to make it a little bit lighter so we can see some definition on the bird. There we go, that's a bit better. And this is a pale form of a Warburg's eagle. And interestingly, they nest not far away from where we're sitting here. I'm not dreaming, was it holding something in its right talon there that it's looking down at that it might start feeding on, or am I dreaming? 
it looks like it may have a kill. And they do like eating frogs, and it just actually flew out of a puddle. And uh, it was just a, a little gall, a little lump on the marula tree that it was latched onto. But it's cleaning its little talons now. Can you believe it? So it was having bath time. You can see its feathers are still wet. And sadly, we flushed it from a little puddle in the road as we came around the corner. Sorry, Mr. or Mrs. Wahlbergs, whichever one you are. Good. Well, we just thought we'd race you across to show you a quick view of it. And I want to try and get to the hyena den as quick as possible. I'm not sure what it was doing then. May have been trying to regurgitate a pellet. Sorts. Doing a funny, strange maneuver with its beak. Ah, oh, we've got a little bit of a battle of the bird lists going on between James Richards and Marilyn and Montana, who are interesting times. James Richards got his 101st bird with an incredible bird of prey, the Marshall Eagle, which I'm glad to claim. This is what I provided you with. So it's a great pleasure, James. Um, cool. Well, it will be interesting, and I look forward to seeing which one of you get to 102 first. Obviously, of course, all of the competitions we have on Safari Live are completely friendly. And a lot of you have got a lot of catching up to do in order to get anywhere close to our friend Mike in Florida, who's well into the 200s on his bird list. So we've got some work to do. It's going to be tricky catching up to him. But it's possible because he's now reaching a point. This might be another one. Tim's these little birds. Oof, it's going to be tricky for us to get a good view. I'm going to stop here. Oh, it's going to be too far. I'm going to have to try and get closer. It's in the center of your shot there, Tebs. Slightly left. There we go. You can work out what it is. You can see it's yellow. You can see it's yellow. Oh, no, sorry, Tebs. You saw another one just at the top of the screen, which is still there. And I'm hoping that this could be an extra one. It's difficult for you to see the colors now. Tebs is tweaking things. Oh, there goes one. There goes the other. Oh. I don't know if we're going to be able to count that, but it's it's up to you guys. I'm going to get it in the book. Give me a second. We are looking for the canaries. Page 192. So, this is the canary page, and the individual we were just looking at now was the yellow-fronted canary which is the most common, really, of the canaries that we see here. But I don't know if the view was good enough to count it, so I'll leave it up to your guys' discretion. But we're trying our best to get you more birds. It's always a bit of a gamble going for these little critters. Manson, I think you've just come up with a great suggestion and reminder, and that is that even though Jamie and Brent and James and myself and Steph jump out the vehicle and are quite comfortable being on foot in this area, I would not recommend performing the same behavior as us when you are coming out to visit us in Africa. A lot of people actually will take themselves on safari and that is possible. You don't have to come and be driven around by a guide in an open Land Rover. You can rent your own car, closed vehicle, regular car of your choice. You could even rent a Ferrari and drive it through the Kruger National Park if that is what you desire. But any regular car, there's tar roads and well, well uh, managed and well looked after dirt roads that you can drive any car down. And you drive yourself on safari and the 
suggestion of warning people not to get out the vehicle is a good one because a lot of the time people jump out of the vehicles and either get themselves killed or they make a huge fool of themselves disturbing the animals so don't be one to fall into that trap and thank you very very much for that update and recommendation because it's a good one we sometimes forget that we need to keep reminding all of the new and everyone joining us on these safaris about some of the basics. Okay, well, we're going to send you back to Jamie, and by the time you come back to us, we should be at the hyena den. Let's hope it's active. Well, Fat, on this beautiful evening, you were just mentioning how nothing beats the sounds and the smells of being around the animals and we hope that and we're glad that you get to experience that while you are away from being in the Sabi Sands. Khat has been to visit the Sabi Sands before in Nottings bush camp but we hope that by describing what we're seeing and what we're feeling we can transmit some of what we experience in this particular sighting towards to you. Even when it's just and not just, I shouldn't say just, but even when it's just a herd of impala. And in fact, that you, that is wagging her tail there, just walking away from us, but upwards, that one, that's walking to the right, she's pregnant still. So you can still expect some late lambs. That's awesome. Even though some of them are already almost <laughs> looking like adult sized and on solid food, there are still some ewes that haven't yet given birth. So for new viewers, you might only have joined us after the impala lambs were born. You've got something to look forward to because in the next few weeks, the late births are gonna to start to happen. You might even see a few new lambs wandering about and you'll get to see what a newborn impala baby looks like. How exciting is that? Having a scratch, are you? Shame, you need an ox picker to come and help you. Ooh, limp. That's not good. Right front foot is injured, or leg is injured. I can't immediately see what it is, but I almost want to say something wrong with the shoulder. It doesn't look like it's sitting right. Oh dear. That's not a weakness that you want to have out here, unfortunately. In a place that is a daily struggle for life and death and for impala that rely on their speed, it's going to come as a disadvantage to this poor impala. Probably ran into some kind of hole, maybe twisted an ankle or a shoulder like that. I just think that shoulder blade doesn't look like it's sitting in the right place. Shame, girl. Who knows? Could heal. You never know. She'll have to stick closely to the safety of the herd. There's always the advantage of safety in numbers. As this herd approaches the open area in front of us that is known as Impala Plains, Daniel, you were wondering if we ever get ostriches here. The reason I link that to the open plains is because generally ostriches like to have nice open areas. They're speed and stamina animals, so they can run for long extended periods of time. What that means for us is that it's quite unusual to see them. Luckily, some of the viewers shared the fact, or very kindly some of the viewers shared the fact that they have seen an ostrich on the live drives before with Tara Perry, who used to be one of the presenters at Wild Earth. So you, they, sightings of those... What are you looking at? Oh, you're just looking at the other part of the things. Um, so sightings of ostriches do happen, but it's quite uncommon. And that's because they don't really like this tight enclosed bushland shrub and closed woodland that we have. <laughs> 
What was that all about, Impala? Maybe just a way of getting across the open area. So you never know, because it's live, we could see an ostrich at any point. They do inhabit the Kruger and they like the big open areas of that particular part of the world. Well guys, I believe that Scott has arrived at the hyena den and it seems as though the hyenas have come out to play. So let's pop over there. Well, we have had a great luck, everyone. Golden, dappled sunlight falling down onto this magnificent den site. Quite a few little cubs out playing. I think that's December 1 and 2 that you've just got a glimpse of. That's November over there, slightly bigger. And we've called them or named them according to when they were born. And because there's so many of them and because we're getting to know this clan quite well, it's useful to name them, not because we think that they're our friends, but simply to monitor the progress and growth and development of them. And just like leopards and zebra, hyena will each have their own individual spot patterns and characteristics. And that's why it's hugely useful to keep track of who's who. Now, some of you are far better at knowing which one's which, so I'll appreciate any assistance you can give us with when we see any of the individuals I don't know. Looks like two adults lying at the entrance to the den, so that little hole that they're lying in leads into a network of burrows. And Tibbs, if you could just zoom out for a second, just to give a full idea of how big this termite mound is, it's colossal. It's no longer active, but there'll be a whole myriad of various tunnels, thanks Tebs, uh, within this termite mound. And the cubs can wiggle their way all the way through. Oh, look at this. A little bit of playful banter. But what's interesting with hyenas is that they will... Oh, quickly, on the left you can hear some audio. And I don't know what to say is going on here. The cubs are sniffing around intently in the rear end of this one individual. It could be an older cub or maybe a male. What's interesting is that I think their mother is lying down and that's why that other adult hyena is licking her nipples. It's not uncommon for hyena to lick the nipples of a lactating female. And the cubs are busy doing the opposite to this other individual. You can see Look at that behavior, the tail's getting flared up. This is gonna get interesting. And we might hear some more audio. Holding their tail up is a sign of dominance when they hold their teg leg tail between their legs. That's a sign of submission. And these animals are incredibly complex in terms of their social structure. Now don't be fooled, that individual, even though it may appear to be a male, that adult, whose genitalia you can clearly see, may actually be a female and the females possess the same genitalia as the males basically they look very similar there is a slight difference on the phallus right at the tip oh but i can't see what's what there and i certainly don't consider myself a professional when sexing hyena so you guys are more than welcome to have a stab at what you think is what there but i don't know anyway isn't this fascinating to see all different shaped and sized hyenas interacting with one another as if we are not even here. And it's also wonderful to watch, and a lot of you would have seen the developments of November, the oldest of the young cubs, as well as December 1 and 2 now, who literally in the last week or two have really started showing a lot more bravery and courage when playing with the other hyena and also moving around the den. And the good news is there's two even smaller cubs that are hidden within the burrows maybe they're around that side there's an entrance to another burrow or network of burrows where they're all standing now and they could be investigating the two even smaller cubs smaller than the two decembers they're little black fur balls and i've only seen a glimpse of them and i'm going to give it a moment or two we might go around that side of the den i just want to wait a bit because they they do move quite a quite a lot and they could very well come back here by the time we get there so let's just give it a moment before we head across as i was saying though there are these two very small cubs and they as you will see over the coming weeks will gain in boldness and in size 
and we're going to get to experience that and share that with you. So quite remarkable, five different cubs all within kind of three months of one another, a couple of sub-adults. This looks like pretty. The mother, and look at this, this other individual. This could be a male to me. Doesn't seem big enough to a female. Possibly, though, an older daughter of Pretty, but Pretty could well be raising her first litter. Judging by what immaculate condition she is, now she's the one lying down. She looks like a younger hyena to me, and that's why she is so immaculate and still so pretty. That will change with time. So who knows, maybe this is an older sub-adult. Oh, the cubs have taken a little bit of a rough and tumble down the termite mound there. That looks like November and December, getting along exceptionally well. Oh, whoopsie, that's June. Thank you, Nikki. And understandably, um, this one was born in June, hence the name. So probably June and November getting along there. Ashley Rose, that's some great news. Your class is going to be joining us in the next few minutes. So let us know as soon as they're all in position and we'll definitely answer some of their questions. Now one thing hyenas do very often is chew on just about anything they can get their teeth on, especially the youngsters. Interestingly, the tree that it's chewing on is called the Tamboti tree. And I wouldn't suggest chewing on it if you were a human or even cooking your meat on the wood from this fire as it will cause you to become ill. And only very occasionally will a... Oh, there's another hyena arriving. Only very occasionally will animals feed on taboti trees and usually, here comes the new arrival. I've seen giraffe doing it from time to time, maybe for medicinal purposes, purposes or kind of a purgatory kind of effect that they try to get to purge their system. Who are you now? Not too sure who this one is, but what we can expect is some kind of excitement as it gets a little bit closer to the others. Let's hope we get some audio here and some vocalizations and some excitement. So I'm just going to keep quiet for a second. And isn't it fascinating how even this one that's just arrived is also going straight to the lactating nipples of pretty. They just can't seem to resist it. Also interesting how obliging pretty is usually Mother hyenas will not let anyone near their nipples other than the cubs who are supposed to be suckling on them. But pretty is obviously not only pretty by looks, but also pretty by personality. She also seems quite relaxed in her spot then. What's interesting with hyenas is once they find a spot at a den site that they like, they usually assume it every single time you see them and they get their comfy spots and it's kind of like the old man of the house having his specific seat in the TV room perhaps. The hyenas are the same. And what's also interesting with hyenas is just how often men are the dominant individuals in the animal kingdom. In hyena society, there's a roles reverse, and it's the females who are the biggest, strongest, and most dominant. So what looks like hap is, is happening now is that some individuals may be heading off to the Gallego waterhole for a drink, 
That's the direction they're heading in, not too far from here. That looks like a, a slightly younger hyena heading off, but isn't it remarkable how bold November's getting there? And these are all important lessons for the hyena. They need to slowly spread their wings and move further and further field from the den sites in order to gain the necessary life lessons along the way. This is the furthest though that I've ever seen November go. What's interesting though is that as young as six months old, hyenas can be taken to dangerous scenarios and usually that's not the case, but you can be very surprised at how young hyenas are when taken into potentially dangerous situations. And I'll never forget when Brent was at a leopard sighting with a big male leopard with a killer in the tree and there was some normal adult sized hyena there and then one of the youngsters dropped up and I think it was about six months old. Just gonna confirm where a, a leopard's just been found just to make sure it's not on Juma. Sorry guys, could you go again with the location? alarm or we don't have to worry it's quite far from us okay copy that thank you so it's on the cut line or but just further east of us okay well I'm not getting too much joy with the location of that leopard but I don't think it is on the property but I'm going to get a further update when another vehicle gets into that position so a little bit of broken down telephone there but there is possibly a chance that there's a female leopard not too far away so that's something exciting to think about and apologies for losing focus on the hyena ah oh, wonderful idea there Tebs and look at the beautiful setting sun it's a magical sunset this evening the wind has died down. It was quite windy when we headed out this afternoon. Oh, Tebs, quickly. <laughs> Here comes November. It obviously got a bit of a fright and has now decided to hastily retreat to the den. Awesome. I'm thinking of repositioning. I've just seen a head poke up on the other side of the den there. Now, that could be the alpha female. Oh, is there a little notch missing out of her ear? That's distinctive characteristic of her and if we go around there we may see her tiny little black cubs well even though there's a lot of action on this side let's take a bit of a gamble oh hang on maybe we'll give it a few minutes look at this oh no shame what happened to you have you got a thorn in your foot or have you twisted your ankle or did you get a horrible bite from that sub adult Oh no. Are you, uh, are you feigning for an Oscar here? I think so. Acting like a soccer player. Faking injury. Um, and as you can see, it quickly recovered and now is actually running off as if nothing ever happened. <laughs> How awesome is this? It is as if we are not even here and we are being allowed such great insights into these animals that so many people have got negative perceptions about. But why? How can you not love these animals just as much as any of the other animals that roam through Africa? They are great fun. And this is a serious, serious display of just how awesome they are. I'll put it down to terrible publicity, mainly thanks to the Lion King that portrayed these awesome animals in a negative light. And it's important to remember that they are critical for African ecosystems to work effectively. And in the year or so that I've been here, we have never been this lucky. We've never had this many um, little hyena cubs running around we've always had kind of one or two on the go but never a den this active and i've just realized that my 
volume, I turned on my volume to the final control room in order to be able to hear the game drive channel clearly. But I'm back up and in touch with you guys again. Wonderful news. Ashley Rose, your class is now in position, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome your class of grade twos to the High Ender Den. Welcome on safari, and I hope you guys are focusing on all of your science work. It's very important that you do, and only if you do all of your science work and homework will your wonderful teacher keep letting you come and join us on these live safaris. So make sure you work hard, and then I'm sure she'll make sure you keep on tuning in to the safaris. But enough of me. Welcome. Send us through some questions, anything you want to know about these hyena. But let's take a closer look, because they're really putting on a good show for us at the moment. There's all different shaped and sized ones. And this is very useful for them. They're going to be learning useful life lessons, even though it looks like they're playing, which they are. They're going to be learning how to wrestle with other hyena, which is going to be useful for them when they grow up. Socially awkward girl who's watching on YouTube. Welcome. And... I hope the more safaris you join us on, the less socially awkward you will become. You would like to know if hyenas' jaws are in fact stronger than that of lions. And yes, I think it is fair to say that. They are the bone crushers of Africa and specifically designed not only to be able to crush through the bones of animals that lion and leopard have abandoned, and carcasses that lions and leopards can no longer feed on. But they also have the digestive juices, very, very strong digestive system, which literally dissolves the bone into a fine powder. And I'm sure the longer you spend with us, we will be able to show you some of their white droppings. They are crystal, crystal clear white. That doesn't work. They are very, very white. That's what I'm trying to get at. And that's because they can process all of the bone and calcium that goes through their digestive systems, whereas the droppings of lion and leopard will contain shards and fragments of bone. Not an easy business knowing where to film while all this action is unfolding, but I think Tebbs is doing a great job. I wonder if the inquisitive little critters are going to come up for a closer look at the vehicle. Sometimes they even start chewing on the tires, at which point we sometimes just tap the side of the vehicle gently, just to say, no, 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 that's a bit too close. Well, it's not just Ashley's class that's watching. We've also got Jackie's class watching in Illinois. And isn't that wonderful? And Andrea would like to know, when will these young hyenas stop drinking milk? When will they stop nursing? It's a great question, Andrea. And it's quite interesting because hyena have developed quite differently to the other carnivores and similar animals to them in this area in that they will nurse for up to a year of age, which is an incredibly long period of time for an animal like this, compared to wild dog, lion and leopard, who will stop nursing, will start eating meat at least, at from three months of age and start uh, stop nursing shortly thereafter because they can rely on meat to sustain them. Hyenas are different, and there's a good reason for that. Because of hyenas methods of finding food and eating, they aren't really afforded the joy of being able to get their cubs weaned off early. And if you think about it, lion, they are the kings of the jungle, they are the most dominant, and therefore they can protect their cubs against most other animals, against hyena, against leopards, so they can afford to take their cubs to dangerous situations where there's meat, where hyena and even leopard may come investigating, looking for an easy meal. 
Leopard can also take their cubs to dangerous situations, to meaty situations, because they're great climbers, and leopard cubs from a young age can climb up into trees and escape lion. Oh, is this the alpha female? I think it is. You can see she's got these notches missing from her ears, or is this corky? Oh, no, that looks like it could be... I'm not too sure. But it looks like it's got an extra tear in the ear, and that's not uncommon. These hyenas do live a rough and rugged life. But this looks like Corky, who is the mother of December 1 and 2. So it's not the alpha female who's got the two smallest cubs. Sorry, Andrea. Um, as I was saying, though, leopards can afford to take their cubs to dangerous situations because they can hoist their kills up into trees and leopard cubs can climb well. Oh, are they going to get some good audio? Listen carefully. It was just warming up there. Maybe it'll continue to something louder. I think it's going to. <laughs> What's interesting is you can hear a hornbill calling nearby now. That wasn't the hyena. And sadly, the hyena seemed to have quietened down a bit, but here they go again. So yes, Andrea, hyena will nurse for a year, whereas most other predators will stop nursing or at least eat, start eating meat from around three months of age. Hyena, because they travel such big distances, they can't always carry back food to the den and therefore rely on their very rich, calcium-rich diets in order to give their cubs some of the most nutritious milk on earth. I think it's the second highest nutritional value of milk, only to that of a leopard seal, some kind of a seal. So they make the finest of milk, these hyena, and that's maybe why all these other hyena keep licking the nipples of the... ...lactating females. Now, who's who here? I think Mickey may have got a glimpse of the alpha female with the very distinctive notches in her ears, but so too does Corky, she's also got a notch in her ear. Okay, well that explains it. I think I had my head looking around at the wrong time and I think Nikki spotted the alpha female lying a little bit up to the left of where we are here, behind Pretty, who's plugged that hole. And I think the alpha female may have just lifted up her head temporarily. Oh, you can just see a little bit of ears moving there on the right of the burrow. Maybe that, oh, okay. So there's the alpha female's head that you can see now. And I think her little tiny black cubs are moving around in there. I think I got a glimpse of one of their ears. Let's watch closely here for a second. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll just get a glimpse of the head of one of these little clubs mountaineering up its mother's body. I think I may have got a glimpse there again. Keep looking closely. McDougald, you have just asked a very in-depth question that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to the bottom of. You would like to know what are the evolutionary advantages of female hyena having similar genitalia to that of the males? And to be honest, it doesn't make sense to give birth through a greatly enlarged clitoris, which is what the female's penis-like adaption is, is not highly effective and can be hugely strenuous for the mother, understandably. Um, 
So, so I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't make perfect sense in my mind when you consider all, well, most all of, of all other mammals that I can think of don't have a similar scenario. It's kind of a throwback. And therefore, I, I don't know what sense it makes. Um, the fact that they've become more dominant and bigger and stronger on average than the males is also fascinating. So, you know, why is it that the females of this species are different to that of almost all other mammals where females will be smaller? I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's various theses and hypotheses of what various people think. But sadly, Annie McDougall, I am not the person to crack that code for you. Looks like bath time, possibly before the adults are heading out. And they will head out shortly, searching for meals. Okay, well, there's just a few minutes left, and we're going to send you across to Jamie so she can say hello and goodbye. And then you'll come back and join us at the den for the last few minutes. Toodle do. And in the final part of what has been an incredible sunset safari, we just thought we'd treat you to one last view of this pale moth Warburg's eagle that you were looking at with Scott earlier. Extraordinarily beautiful bird. It was briefly joined by its mate. And we see them fairly regularly. And the female took off, leaving the male behind in this extraordinary evening light. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this sunset safari. I'm so glad that you got to experience that. What I would say was probably not only my best dwarf mongoose sighting, but probably high up there with some of the best sightings in terms of animal behavior I've actually experienced while I've been working at Wild Earth. So I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. A big thank you and a huge well done to VM for capturing those wonderful moments in what was split second decisions and moments within that sighting. You did an incredible job and I'm sure you'll all agree. And a big thank you to the lovely ladies in FC for all that they do for us and for being the wonderful dulcet tones that we hear in our ear every single drive. Thank you for your questions and your comments and a big well, warm welcome to all of our new viewers. We hope that you join us tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari because as you know, you just never know what's going to happen or what to expect. Have a wonderful day or a wonderful night or a wonderful evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'll see you tomorrow. Cheers, guys. So the hyenas are still all jostling about. A little bit of low audio. And if a, some of you have not heard a hyena call before, it's something to really look forward to. It's an incredible sound. And they interestingly make quite a few different sounds. So you're going to have to keep tuning in if you want to hear that because my impersonations are not going to be any good and certainly not going to do the hyena any justice. Ah, uh, Stephanie who is in Mrs. Rose's class, class 2A. You've asked a good question. You would like to know what causes the hyenas to laugh, and that's one of the sounds that they make. And it's usually an exciting situation or a scary situation for them if they come across lion or if they come across a leopard with a kill and they're trying to chase it away, they will laugh loudly in excitement. So that's usually, like I say, an exciting or a dangerous situation that will cause them to let out this loud, loud laughing cackle, whereas their kind of whooping howl, which I just did an impersonation of, is more for kind of general communication over long distance. Here we've been hearing low murmurs. And again, this is for maybe close contact communication. But they've got various different noises that they will make. 
but that laughing sound is one of the eerie sounds of Africa, and you know when you hear that, that there's some an action unfolding and that you should race your vehicle into that area as quick as possible to make sure you don't miss out. Very interesting question through from Mary in Michigan, wondering whether or not the hyena chewing on this toxic tamburti trees may help rid them of worms or have any benefits to them. I don't think so, Mary. And maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's pure teething like any puppy or kitten would do. They like chewing on just about anything they can. Good, well, it's rapidly come to a close and it's a wonderful, wonderful safari this afternoon. It's been a great pleasure having you. A reminder that from the 1st of February, we're going to be heading out at 5.30 in the morning, half an hour later. Tebs, thank you very much. To Nikki, who directed the show, and Kirsty, who was lending her hand, a very big thank you as well. And a reminder, tomorrow you're going to have Brett and Brent, the two Bs, taking you out on safari. Be nice to my friend Brett and really look forward to hearing his feedback on his first live safari. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.